Welcome to the first session in the Hopkins at Home series presented by the Johns Hopkins University Women's Suffrage Centennial Commemoration. Thanks for joining us. I'm Natalie Elder, Curator of Cultural Properties at the Chesney Medical Archives for Johns Hopkins Medicine, Nursing, and Public Health. I'm pleased to be here with Kathleen Waters Sander. Hi, Kathy, how are you? Hello, I'm fine. Thank you, Natalie. Kathleen is, um, she teaches at uh, history at the University of Maryland Global Ca Campus, and she's the author of the book we're going to be talking about, Mary Elizabeth Garrett, Society and Philanthropy in the Gilded Age. Um, so we're going to talk about this biography and how Mary Garrett's philanthropy advanced women's education and political power. I'll also show you a preview of a new online exhibit by the Chesney Archives about Hopkins doctors and nurses who are involved in the push for votes for women. I would like to point out here that when we talk about the 19th Amendment, we must recognize that its passage does not enfranchise all women and that the movement in the 19th and early 20th centuries was a segregated one with white men and women excluding black activists who were fighting for the vote. During our discussion, we welcome you to ask any questions you have by typing them into the chat module on your screen throughout the talk, and we will leave time at the end to answer them. We'll also welcome you to join the following sessions in this uh, women's suffrage series. You can find a link to the other sessions on your screen below this video. You can also join the conversation on social by using the hashtag JHU Women's Vote 100. Um, so I just want to start it off by showing everyone the wonderful new edition of um, this is a commemorative paperback edition of Kathy's book. And uh, one of the great things about it is it's got a new Ford by um, Senator Barbara Mikulski. So with that, let's jump into our discussion. And um, I think, you know, we'll begin at the beginning, Kathy. And can you tell us a little bit about how you became interested in writing Garrett's biography? Well, thank you, Natalie. And also thank you to all the archivists who put together that wonderful um, exhibit. I have looked through it a couple times and it's, it's very interesting how you have incorporated all the different populations of Hopkins people over the years who fought for uh, the 19th Amendment. Now, as far as getting started with this book, it, I think it has sort of a funny uh, start and, and Senator Mikulski factors into it in a big way. About 20 years ago, I was um, at a luncheon and uh, sitting next to Senator Mikulski, and we were chit-chatting away, and I, I had not yet started on, on this biography. I, I was interested in Mary Garrett because I had read little snippets about her over the years, and I was fascinated about why this millionaire, this heiress, would give money to start a medical school at a men's university. So I was expressing this to Senator Mikulski. And all of a sudden she perked up and she said, you have to get this story out there. It is so important. This Mary Garrett story is so important. And she, you know, Senator Mikulski, she was sort of pounding on the table and telling me how important this was. And I thought, well, you know, I can't argue with her. And so I better get cracking. And I did. And uh, so the book came out eight years later and it was truly a labor of love because um, I, over the years, I grew very fond of Mary Garrett and I definitely admire her so much and uh, admired all the things she accomplished with her limited um, political um, uh, restrictions. So anyway, it was Senator Mikulski and I do thank her for, for uh, writing the foreword to the, um, to the uh, uh, paperback. So Mary Garrett, as mentioned, is an intriguing figure and I, I tend to think that she, as a young girl, did not show any sort of uh, promise to be a great activist, a, a great game changer, as she turned out to be. She was born into a, a wealthy uh, Baltimore family. Her father was president of the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad. And as you know from your 19th century history, uh, the railroad tycoons sort of ruled the country. And... So she 
uh, had a life of privilege and affluence and, and she traveled quite a bit, but she also learned early in life about the restrictions that women had. She had two older brothers, Robert and Harry. And for those of you who are in Baltimore or are familiar with Baltimore, you know of Evergreen House. And that was Harry's house when he grew up. So Robert and Harry, her brothers, as they grew up, um, were given a lot more advantages than Mary. And Mary was sent uh, to a, a, well, basically what we would call a finishing school while her brothers went off to Princeton and had much different experiences. But what makes it sort of interesting, and I'm sure she didn't know it at the time, was that she was getting an education unlike anything any other young girl would get. Because her father was, um, he admired her greatly. She was smart, she was inquisitive, she was curious about the, the railroad business. And when she was um, uh, an older adolescent, late teens, she started traveling with her father and she became his secretary and she sat in on business meetings with uh, the other railroad tycoons. And she learned what probably few other young girls learned during that era. And that was the, the masculine side of life, the male side of life, what men did in these meetings, how they hammered out deals, how they uh, sort of uh, just um, made, the, made their points, stuck to their guns, got their deal done. And she, she, uh, she learned from this and this became very important in her philanthropies. And her father often said he wished that Mary had been born a boy, even though he had, he had three sons actually, uh, two of them, uh, as mentioned, Robert and Harry. Um, the other son, Henry, um, had a disability. We don't know much about him. But uh, John Garrett, Mary's father, greatly admired Mary and uh, said he wished she had been a boy. But of course, a girl, Mary could not have followed him into the railroad business like, like his sons did. Anyway, uh, her, I, I guess the pivotal moment in her life came when her father died. And up until that time, she had no idea how she was going to survive uh, because she was completely dependent on her parents for money and she lived with them and she didn't know how she was going to survive. She was very fearful that she was going to end up having to live with her one of her brothers and, and, or her sisters-in-law and they did not get along. So that was of great concern to her. But after her father died and she uh, learned about his will, uh, that was a very happy point in her life because she inherited six and a half million dollars. He, he died with, a, with an estate of about 16 or 18 million dollars and she inherited a third of it with the other two thirds uh, divided among, uh, between her two older brothers. And so she was pretty ecstatic over this. And she vowed at that moment that she was going to spend her great fortune to help women because she saw the restrictions that she herself had experienced. She saw it all around her in society, how, how women, especially women, middle and upper class women like herself uh, were very restricted. And she wanted to change all that. So uh, this was around 1884. And she luckily had some very uh, uh, interesting companions. And they formed a group called the Friday Night. And they would get together on Friday nights and they'd go to the theater. They would, they would talk like girls do. And they would discuss the opposite sex. They would discuss marriage and how they didn't approve of it and uh, other topics like that. But they also had a wider view of the world and they wanted to do something to uh, help women's education. So the first thing they did was they came up with an idea of starting a school for, for girls, not like the finishing school that Mary went to, but a very rigorous school that would teach the same topics as, as boys were learning. And that school became the Bryn Mawr School, which is still going strong today in Baltimore. 
And they next set their sights on Johns Hopkins University, which um, was very near and dear to Mary's heart and also her family's because Johns Hopkins, the man was uh, a close friend of Mary's father. In fact, Hopkins was really like a mentor to John Garrett and uh, Hopkins and Mary's grandfather had come to Baltimore at the same time and became merchants and struck it rich. And so uh, the Garretts and, and Johns Hopkins were very close. And we all know the story of when Hopkins died, he left an estate of $7 million to be divided evenly between the university and um, the hospital. And by the late 1880s, the hospital had been built and was opened. It was, as the New York Times said, it was the, the most advanced hospital in the world, according to the Times. It was very advanced and very scientific. And But uh, one thing that Johns Hopkins really wanted was a medical school, a very advanced medical school, because at that time, medicine was a, a, a pretty sorry profession. Uh, a doctor did not have to have a degree, did not even really have to take any courses, could just hang out his sign on Main Street and say that he was practicing medicine. But yes. Hopkins University uh, was losing money because of the, the great depressions that, that hit through the 1880s and 90s. And it didn't have any money to open this much anticipated medical school. So Mary and her friends decided to get together and form a national campaign to raise money to open a medical school and also to raise awareness about how medicine needed to be elevated. And uh, so they did this and, and Mary, without the benefit of social media and email, actually uh, formed um, uh, chapters around the country and women, wealthy women around the country joined these chapters and they, they would go out in the community and talk about the, the need to, to um, elevate medicine and the practice of medicine, the education of medicine. And also most important to Mary, to have women have the same advantages uh, and access to medical schools that men did. But after um, a couple of years of this agonizing campaign the women did not raise enough money for various reasons, mostly because most of them were married and married women at the time did not control their money. And um, so Mary eventually came through with the most of the $500,000 that the trustees required to open this medical school. But what makes her story so intriguing was how she, she uh, presented five conditions uh, for the trustees to accept her, her, her gift before they could open the medical school. First and foremost, she wanted women applicants to be accepted on the same terms as men. She wanted the medical school to be a graduate school. And uh, both of these were unprecedented uh, conditions because at that time, as mentioned, uh, people did not even uh, have to have a a degree to become a physician. And women were not admitted to medical schools at that time because the professors of medicine did not want to teach anything about anatomy and body parts to a, a class where there were women sitting in the classroom. Women were not supposed to know about these things, of course. Right. So um, Anyway, and her other conditions were that uh, the students had to have a certain background in uh, sciences and, and, um, and uh, she also wanted the university to erect a building on the medical campus to acknowledge the efforts of the women across the country who were involved in this campaign. So anyway, after much haggling, the, the, the trustees finally accepted her terms and I, I often wish I could have been a fly on the wall to, to listen to them because they were terrified of, of uh, accepting these terms uh, from to make it a graduate school, to accept women. These were all really, really radical ideas at that time because women were not supposed to have any uh, capability of intellectual 
um, uh, endeavors. They were not supposed to be able to understand anatomy and God forbid that they should be exposed to any sort of body functions. But anyway, so Mary prevailed. Never mind the fact that they were helping women give birth. You know, yeah, well, as, childbirth. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but they once, but you know, they were supposed to be comatose when they gave birth. But anyway, um, Mary prevailed with all this, and the Hopkins uh, trustees finally accepted her her terms. And uh, so, in 1893, the the Hopkins Medical School opened up with 15 students, uh, male students and three women students. And uh, that really made the headlines. And from that moment on, Mary Garrett became very, very uh, well known, well publicized across the nation for doing this because her gift not only elevated women's medical education, it elevated medicine in general. And because her rich endowment made possible um, the uh, effort to do research in a lab and then uh, apply that research to uh, patients. So it changed medicine, it changed medical philanthropy because suddenly uh, medicine became a very important uh, philanthropic priority. So it really changed the, the game a lot. But Mary wasn't satisfied with just doing that. She then went on to support Bryn Mawr College because her friend Carrie Thomas was up for the presidency of that. And once again, Mary bribed the trustees of Bryn Mawr, <laughs> Bryn Mawr College by offering $10,000 a year if they would appoint her friend, who was extremely capable of being president, if they would appoint her president of Bryn Mawr and keep her there long enough so she could apply her, um, her new ideas. She was very advanced intellectually. So Mary already at the age of uh, 38 or 40 had these great accomplishments behind her, the Bryn Mawr School, uh, the medical school, Bryn Mawr College, but she was not finished yet. And uh, by the 1890s, uh, ray, uh, suffrage began to come onto her radar screen. She'd been aware of it, of course, but she finally had time to devote energy to it. And she did that in a big way. And once again, she prevailed in her determination to get what she wanted. And in the fall of 1905, uh, Susan B. Anthony and Anna Howard Shaw came to visit her at, at Bryn, uh, Mary was living at Bryn Mawr College at the time. And Mary proposed to hold the 1906 suffrage meeting in Baltimore. And this just floored the suffrage leaders because Baltimore at that time was a very, uh, shall I say, regressive city. It was Southern, very tradition bound. It had been during the Civil War, a slave holding state. And uh, it still retained a lot of its Southerness. And so Anthony and the other leaders were terrified of, of having such an important um, conference convention in, um, in such a um, conservative city. In fact, Emma Funk, who was um, president of the Baltimore, <clears throat> pardon me, the, the Maryland Suffrage Club, uh, said that, that Baltimore, although the, the residents meant well, they had never really discarded their silver buckles and their ruffled sleeves. And I think that's a great image to think of, of Baltimore at that time. But Mary prevailed, and in 1906, the big uh, National American Women's uh, Suffrage Association came to town, and it was a huge hit. Uh, and uh, Mary, who lived in a 30-room mansion on Mount Vernon Place, opened her, her doors to the, the suffrage leaders who all stayed there. Susan B. Anthony uh, was, of course, the most well-known of, of, of the, the suffrage leaders. And when she arrived at Mary's home, she was ill. And she was 86 years old at that point. She had come down from Rochester, New York in February. And by the time she got to Mary's home, she was quite ill. And Mary was uh, very concerned about that. So she, she wanted to call in doctors to uh, just tend to Anthony. 
Well, Anthony would not have any of that. She didn't want anyone to fuss over her. But Mary got the best of her because she, uh, Mary called her upon her friends over the medical school, the doctors and some of the nurses. And she had them come to her home for a few days, dressed as butlers and maids to attend to, um, to Anthony. But uh, they all stayed, all the leaders stayed at Mary's mansion. And the others, uh, the other delegates stayed at the Belvedere Hotel, which was very elegant hotel. And they had their, their meetings every day at the Ly Lyric Theater. And Mary attended the, the, uh, the presentations, which were very lively, very timely, and some very controversial. The, the delegates uh, talked about uh, working women and working women's wages and prostitution and a lot of issues that were just com becoming, uh, coming to the fore during that progressive era. And Mary was very interested and she would sit there in her box seat at the Lyric um, Theater and listen to all the, the great uh, presentations. And um, so the, the problem with suffrage at that point by the 1890s and the turn of the century, it was really beginning to wane. Uh, it had lost a lot of its, um, its uh, uh, militancy or it actually was, I'm sorry, it was, it was considered to be too militant for uh, many middle-aged, uh, middle-class women to be interested in. So they needed a new strategy. And uh, Anthony came up with an idea to have what she called the society plan. And th this was an idea to get more wealthy women involved, women of affluence, influence, who could not only um, generate a lot of excitement with their, with their names and their status, but also give money. At that time, uh, suffrage had only $28,000 in its coffers. And it was running out of money, it was running out of steam. Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who of course was um, the most militant of all of them, had died a couple of years earlier. But before she died, she um, had written what she called the Women's Bible. And she had gone through the St. James Version and, and underlined everything, every passage in the Bible that she thought was uh, debased women and uh, held women back. So she was more or less on the fringes of, of the movement when she died anyway. But the, the movement really needed uh, a rebranding, as it were. And Mary uh, was very instrumental at this moment in helping to do that. And at the end of the convention, Anthony talked to, to Mary and Mary's friend, Carrie Thomas, and said, look, we have to raise money and uh, we're just gonna wither on the vine here if we don't. And so, um, Mary and her friend, Carrie Thomas, uh, came up with the idea of asking women of influence to give $500,000 each. And, and Anthony thought this was outrageous. I mean, who could give that kind of money? But the, the fundraising campaign was very successful and they raised over $30,000 in three months. Or maybe it was 60,000 <laughs> in three months. Anyway, they, they raised a lot of money in just a, a short period of time. And that and was such a contra. Sorry to interrupt, but it's such a contradiction with the um, with the women's medical school fund for Johns Hopkins because it, she had so much trouble raising money for it, that. It was exactly, and thanks for pointing that out. That was um, it was a whole different uh, issue. Right. Medical education was uh, very Just, controversial, but mm -hmm. so was suffrage. But it was amazing, and I think your exhibit uh, points this out. Your wonderful exhibit, uh, all the different populations of people from Hopkins, but you can just enlarge that nationwide. The people who did uh, support suffrage by the early uh, decade of the 19, uh, 20th century. But what was really sort of a sensitive point for, for Mary Garrett was her sister-in-law, who Mary Frick Garrett, who was married to Robert Garrett, Mary's brother, was president of the Maryland anti-suffrage league. And uh, as Mary and her cohorts worked hard to, to get an amendment passed so women could vote, Mary Frick Garrett and her 
influential friends worked as hard to, to stop it because at the time um, it was felt that women, uh, that power for women emanated from the home. Women would run the home, men would run the, com- uh, the country. And that to many women was the way they wanted things. So there was a great anti-movement. And I think uh, you have a great image and yeah, if you want to share this now, um, this is um, this is from the Anti-Suffrage Society. It's a postcard from 1906, and it, it's called A Woman's Mind Magnified. And um, you can see that it's sort of, um, you know, women are supposed to be thinking about clothing and catching a husband and um, babies. And there's really no room for, you know, intellectual life or political involvement. Um, right, right. And you know, this is what they had to fight against. And with, with Mary Frick Garrett, you know, and also they lived across the street from each other, basically. They, so. they did. They, and they would vacation <laughs> together. And wouldn't that be fun? Good thing they didn't have yeah. to quarantine together. Yeah, but, right. uh, uh, yeah they, the, you know, women, as we know, even now, women have never really been on the same page as far as important issues. Uh, they have different ideas and uh, that's what keeps things going but uh yeah and i might add that during the medical school campaign when mary garrett was trying to raise money to get women admitted to the medical school her sister-in-law also was against that so again and mary frick was a very accomplished woman but again she had very diverse uh, polarized views from from mary garrett but um, that's what so, makes women interesting, I think. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to jump in here. Um, and thanks for outlining kind of her three um, biggest uh, philanthropic uh, causes and, and Bryn Mawr and Johns Hopkins and suffrage. Um, I want to go back, though, to the Bryn Mawr School, which is uh, the school, the college preparatory school in Baltimore that um, she opened with the help of the Friday night group that she was a part of. And mm-hmm. um, and if you could just talk about a little bit about this school was different um, than the school Mary had gone to, for instance, Miss Coomer's school for girls. Um, and it was, it was offering a different kind of education for young women. And you want to tell us a little bit more about what, what, what they yeah. were doing at Bryn Mawr. Well, that also made headlines, but it's controversial. Uh, yeah. It was controversial because it offered well, traditionally boys um, subjects math and sciences and languages and uh, all the subjects that that boys were learning at their private schools. And what was most interesting is the school also offered physical education. And as you know, (laughs) that was such a hot topic. Women were not supposed to overexert themselves. That um, That would ruin their chances of marriage certainly would ruin their chances of, of uh, conceiving a child. And uh, so, but Mary insisted, Mary and her friends who started the Bryn Mawr School insisted on having uh, physical education. And to this end, Mary in her travels around the world would collect all sorts of uh, interesting kinds of gymnastic equipment from Europe. And she also wanted a swimming pool. And this uh, was, Uh, again, a very uh, sort of radical idea for young women to go swimming. And uh, yeah, so the the Bryn Mawr School, when it opened, did make headlines for its controversy in a good way. I think uh, people were ready to see, most people were were ready to see women better educated. Uh, There was a time earlier in the century that uh, the feeling was women just had to be educated to uh, be good wives and to be able to carry on a conversation and to pour tea correctly. But by the end of the century, after the Civil War, much had changed and women expectations for women were very different after the Civil War than before. So yes, the Bryn Mawr School was uh, controversial, but extremely successful and it still is after 140 years or something, yeah. it's still going strong. Right here in Baltimore, yeah. Um, so another thing that I want to talk about um, was kind of a two-part thing, but Mary, um, despite what she accomplished in life, she, she faced a lot of kind of physical, but also mental 
ailments. Yeah. And, um, you know, one of the things that unfortunately people thought at the time was that educating women would have such a um, deleterious effect on them. And um, so I was going to read a quote from E.H. Clark, who that's in your book, um, who mentions he is a physician and an author who um, writes about the dangers of educating women. And I think this is such an interesting quote. He says, um, rigorous education for women would lead to, quote, monstrous brains and puny bodies, abnormally active cerebration and abnormally weak digestion, flowing thought and constipated bowels. <laughs> Um, That's a great just, quote, isn't it? It is. You and can't it, it's, that. <laughs> it's, it's outlandish to think that, but, you know, I think Mary at some point in her own life struggled with, um, you know, worrying about her own health in, in a way. Some of her complaints might have been, her physical complaints might have been a little bit psychosomatic. And, and she certainly had sort of mental periods of what was then probably called like neurasthenia or, you know, now is probably mm -hmm. more thought of as depression. Um, but it was um, her personal physician, Dr. Uh, Mary Putnam Jacoby, who um, not only kind of publicly refuted this, this book that Clark had written about educating women, but he taught, she, her relationship with Mary was important as far as Mary's own confidence, um, I think. Right. Well, um, Yes, Mary did have uh, physical problems, and she claims that when she was an infant, the nurse had dropped her and injured her leg, and that caused a lot of damage to her one leg, and she had to wear braces for a long time, which uh, was um, quite a hindrance to her. And she also had uh, trouble with vision, and her brothers, her older brothers, were always making fun of her. And um, so she, she had those problems. But more than that, um, because she found there were so many closed doors to her and open doors for men, and that uh, really affected her. And yes, she did have this problem with uh, neurasthenia, as, as it was called. In fact, it was almost an expectation for middle and upper class women to have this because, well, they couldn't do anything else. Right. And so, of course, they got sick. And yeah, um, no, I like in your book how you describe it almost as a path that women would take they, um, yeah. as and an acceptable was, choice. It was a path. It was very acceptable. And Mary was treated for this for a long time. And and uh, she uh, her father took her to doctors in Europe. But then she met Dr. Jacoby. And at that time, uh, Dr. Jacoby was a very prominent woman, not only because she refuted uh, Dr. Clark's book in a very powerful way, but she was also just an excellent physician. And uh, Mary first went to her as a, as a patient, and then they became good friends. And uh, Dr. Jacoby uh, then began to travel with Mary and w with her family. And uh, she was with Mary when, when uh, Mary's father died. And so, yes, they, they were very close. And Dr. Jacoby played a, a great role in convincing Mary about the importance of women being educated, women physicians being educated equal to men. Because at the time, uh, there were men's medical colleges, but women weren't admitted. And Jacoby thought that the big problem was not so much in the education, but that after uh, finishing medical school, women could not uh, get good residencies or internships at the big urban hospitals where they would learn uh, so much more than in a smaller clinic. And so Jacoby was very, very uh, important in Mary's life and, and very influential. And she, uh, I mean, these ideas of, of making the new Hopkins Medical School um, co um, a graduate school were, were floating around because uh, some of the doctors had wanted that. And uh, in Europe, this was the, the model uh, that uh, uh, medical students had to have a graduate degree and do research. And, and so the idea had been floated around in Baltimore to make this new medical school much like a European school. But for Mary, as far as striking a deal with the trustees, her 
her influence came for, definitely from, from Jacoby, Dr. Jacoby. Yeah, and um, I think the Blackwell sisters as well, um, you know, had an influence. And then of course, these are women who, um, these doctors go on to advocate for suffrage as well. And I think mm -hmm. that's another legacy of, of Mary Garrett's is that um, by pushing for women's education, she really was creating a whole generation of women who were going to expect more and more participation in political life and, mm -hmm. and in, in deciding, you know, what happened in the public sphere. Um, so uh, another one of um, the questions that I wanted to ask is, and this is kind of um, like a Gilded Age versus Progressive Era question, but Mary was very, um, she spent a lot of money. Uh, she had a lot of money. She spent a lot of money. She lived very lavishly. Do you see any kind of tensions between, um, you know, the, the, the sort of classic Gilded Age excess and then her, um, her personal giving and her, mm -hmm. the, the, the classic kind of late 19th century, you know, era of philanthropy, but with huge wealth inequalities? Um, well, uh, she did live large, definitely. And she learned that from her family, her father. Um, uh, of course, she, when she was growing up, her family had several estates. And, um, but Mary did spend a lot on travel and on her mansions. But what makes her so interesting, and she, wasn't, uh, she, she didn't have unlimited money. And when she started deep into her philanthropies, like with the Bryn Mawr School, which cost $500,000 to build, that was a lot of money. And then uh, the money that she gave to Hopkins Medical School and then Bryn Mawr. She was really out on a limb as far as finances. And she often worried about that. She was actually very frugal personally. And she kept account books, which are interesting to look through because she kept track of everything. And she worried about, uh, was she overspending? And, uh, and she probably was, but she, when she died, she died with about a million dollars. And so she did have a little nest egg there, but yeah, she lived large and she was constantly redecorating her. Redecorating uh, is just. <laughs> yeah, she redecorated <laughs> and decorated again. And uh, of course she had to keep up and, and she entertained not only with suffrage, but also with the medical school fund as she was trying to raise money for that. And, and she was known to be quite generous with, with all that. Yeah. She, she, you know, she did, um, she did worry about uh, spending too much and uh, she was very eager to get these things done. And, and that, I think, again, that's what makes her so interesting it wasn't that she could just toss out $500,000 here and there. Uh, she worried about it. And, uh, and she, but those causes, those issues were so important to her. And, you know, there's, there's an old saying in philanthropy that uh, you have to find the pain in a philanthropist's heart <laughs> in order to, and for Mary, that pain was uh, the restrictions that she had uh, experienced herself and also in larger society, the how women were, were held back. She was really angry that it become election time every year that her male servants could vote and she couldn't. Yeah. <laughs> so she, she wanted to vote too. Well, I think, you know, interestingly on the other side of philanthropy too, I think Mary was very good at figuring out um, what the institutions that she was going, she were going to to give to needed, mm -hmm. and and finding their weaknesses. And I, I think, as a philanthropist, she was smart about that, right? You you talk about this in your book how she was like, okay, I figured out what how I can get them to kind of agree to me. And well, that's why the Hopkins Medical School is such a wonderful story. And I wish we had a lot of time to go into that because I know. Uh, just the whole uh, back and forth with. Um, with the campaign to raise the money and the trustees were always changing their minds about things. And uh, at one point uh, after just a couple of years of the campaign, which lasted maybe four years, but a couple of years into it, she offered to give the money and the trustee said, Oh, I don't think so. Maybe we'll get back to you on that. 
and then they raised the ante and um, and in the final months of all that, I could just from from her letters, I could just see the steam coming out of her ears and she was getting so mad at these trustees because Hopkins, Johns Hopkins, the man was very near and dear to her family. Yes. And uh, he wanted a, a really advanced scientific medical school and the trustees were just balking right and left. And of course there weren't any male donors out there who wanted to give uh, large sums of money to medicine. Medicine was a very unproven field at that point. And uh, because her father, because Johns Hopkins had won at this medical school, she's just zeroed in on them. And in the final negotiations, when the, when the trustees did not want to accept this and when the president, uh, Gilman, didn't want to accept it, she just basically said what she had learned from sitting in on all those railroad meetings. It's on the table, you take it or leave it. And uh, they eventually had to take it. Um, okay, so I'm gonna, we're getting a lot of good questions. So I'm gonna um, launch into some of them now. Um, this is, the first question is from Karen, uh, Carol Ann, excuse me, um, who says, given all of her money, why couldn't Mary use it to influence politics as so many millionaires did and still do? Um, and I, I, I think what, oh. the, Probably the questioner is asking is, is why not just give directly to uh, politicians mm -hmm. um, to kind of accomplish maybe some of her goals? Yeah, interesting question. Um, I don't know if uh, she thought that was the right avenue to take. For example, with, um, with Bryn Mawr College, when she offered $10,000 a year to keep her friend Carrie Thomas in the presidency, um, she felt that was the most direct way I don't, uh, and with the medical school, again, I don't know if politicians were really going to be involved with that. Her father right. certainly paid off politicians uh, yes. in his role as, a, a, as the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad president. He had the whole state legislature in his pocket as railroad presidents were expected to do. But I, I think Mary just went directly to the heart of the matter and again, held out the money and said, here it is, take it or leave it. Yeah. So this is from Nathaniel. And I, um, this is one of the things I wanted to bring up too in relation to the Bryn Mawr School on this, but it says, who taught at Mary's schools? Um, and what kind of teachers were excited to be a part of the projects? And I think, you know, you can go into a little bit about how the teachers at Bryn Mawr were different. Well, they were all college educated. And what was, again, funny, there were so many, uh, the, the Mary Garrett story is so interesting because there are so many sort of comical sides to it. When uh, Mary and her friends were thinking of opening this controversial Bryn Mawr school, they wanted to hire college educated women. And uh, one of the trust, they had a couple of people on their board of trustees, uh, people they thought would help them in the community to raise awareness of education. And one of them was Daniel Coit Gilman, who was president of Johns Hopkins University. And Hopkins, um, or I'm sorry, Gilman told the, the women who were fa uh, starting the Bryn Mawr School, told Mary, do not hire women faculty and don't expect them to have college degrees. Well, the women <laughs> just went ahead and did exactly the opposite. And they hired a first-rate uh, faculty. Yeah. So um, this one is from Judith. Um, she's asking about Mary's legacy as a role model and how it influenced Johns Hopkins women in medicine now and in the 21st century. Um, are there any JH buildings, library collections, statues named after Mary? Um, you can answer, I think, some of this, but I would like to say that last... I believe it was either last year or the year before, I think last January, um, the boardroom at the School of Medicine was renamed the Mary Elizabeth Garrett Boardroom. So that is one thing that um, Hopkins has recently done to commemorate Mary, but you can talk a little bit about some of the other um, non-recognition and recognition. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, Natalie, this is a real sore point, point with me because yeah, when, um, first of all, she's not recognized the way she should be. Uh, when Daniel Coit Gilman was desperate to find a donor, a male donor 
for the medical school back in the 1880s. And he wrote to the trustees that any male, he wanted to find a male donor and that male donor would have his name on the medical school. Mm -hmm. And that was in Gilman's handwriting and it is there for everyone to see, but the medical school is not named the Mary Elizabeth Garrett Medical School. But the thing that I find um, should really be corrected is one of the five criteria that she gave for the found for the trustees to accept her her money was uh, not only uh, to allow women and the graduate school and all that, but one of the criteria was she wanted um, a building to be erected on the medical the new medical campus, which only at that time had one building, but she wanted a building uh, to be named for all the women who formed chapters around the, the country to raise awareness about medicine. And she wanted that building to be named the uh, Medical School Fund building. Well, that building was erected, and but unfortunately it was torn down in 1979. And what has replaced it now is I think the pre-clinical sciences building or some really on exotic name like that. And that is on the site where the, the women's medical school. Now, um, what's interesting inside that building, and this is another thing that sort of got me started on Mary, the Mary Garrett project. There used to be a little display on the wall, pictures of the Friday night group and pictures of Mary Garrett and some bricks from the original building. And those were on a little exhibit in this preclinical sciences building. And that, that's it. But I think that building should be renamed or th certainly there should be uh, a building on the medical campus named for her. And I've been on my soapbox about this for 20 years. <laughs> and the answer has always been, well, we can't name a building after uh, Mary Garrett because we're waiting for a big donor. Well. I mean, you can hardly even respond to that um, without Mary Garrett or when <laughs> in a medical school campus. Anyway, so no, uh, but I think for the women faculty now, she has become a great, great role model. Uh, yeah. And, yeah, many of the, the women have pictures of her on the, their office walls. And she, she's someone that they can look, look at and say, yeah, Mary Garrett did this and she made this possible against all odds. Yeah. So I have a, um, we probably can't get too much into this, but this is from Gabrielle. Um, Did M. Carey Thomas influence Mary Garrett's ideas? It seems like Mary was pro-suffrage before they became intimate. I'm also curious about whether Thomas's racism and anti-Semitism rubbed off on Mary. Um, oh, interesting, because there's certainly yeah. been a lot uh, about Thomas in, in the last yeah. couple of years. Um, no, you know, the answer to that is, Mary Garrett and Thomas uh, really uh, lived their lives in different social circles. I mean, they, they were very fond of each other. They lived together. And, uh, but Mary was in a very worldly uh, social cir uh, circle because of her family's name and influence. And Thomas, who came from a um, highly respectable and but m much more modest family in Baltimore, uh, really uh, moved around in, in, in a different circle. Did Thomas's anti-Semitic views influence Mary? No, not that I read at all in any of her thousands of letters. Uh, no, she was much more worldly. And, uh, and in fact, Mary even fights um, Thomas on the, the acceptance of Judy, uh, Jewish students Jew into, yeah. into to Bryn the Bryn Mawr School. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. Mary's you know, Mary pushes no. back on her and says, no, we're not, we're not discriminating on this. I mean, it was obviously yeah. still racially segregated and they discriminated on that basis. But. Well, it was racially segregated because we have to remember this was the Jim Crow era. This was right. a highly segregated time of, um, in the country. So we can't put, uh, you know, without being too much of an apologist, we can't put too much blame on these women for not accepting African students, African American students, but uh, no, I don't think Thomas influenced her in that way. Uh, Mary had her own mind, and uh, she was a very smart woman. 
and she uh, she could uh, you know she tried to put up with Thomas the best she could. Thomas was uh, known to just sort of fly off the handle, and I find her to be a highly unlikable person. I don't know why. Well, I do know why Mary put up with her because. Thomas was president of Bryn Mawr College, and Mary really craved, really wanted that academic uh, association. And so she got that when she was affiliated with, with Bryn Mawr as a donor, and she was on the board of trustees. And so she really loved that. So they each gave each other what they wanted. Uh, Mary gave Thomas her money, and Thomas gave Mary uh, some academic cachet. Right, exactly. Um, so this is a, a little bit of a different question. Um, where did Dr. Jacoby get her medical education? And um, oh. I believe uh, it's, it, uh, it's the Medical College of Pennsylvania. Yes, yes. And that was, that was the big one, the, the most well-known medical college for women at the time. Mm -hmm. And it was well-funded, well-established. It had a good faculty. but uh, And there were other medical schools for women around the country. But, but again, they were not very well funded, not like the men's colleges were. But yes, Dr. Jacoby, and she, uh, Dr. Jac Jacoby came from the publishing family of, of Putnam uh, in New York. So that's a little factoid. But uh, uh, she was uh, such a great writer. And that's how she got started in medicine. That's how she sort of supported herself at first was writing. And then she got into medicine. But yes, she did go to the, uh, I think it was called the, uh, either the Philadelphia or the Pennsylvania School of Medicine. I forget which one. I think it's the Medical, Medical College of Pennsylvania is she gets yeah. her MD. Mm -hmm. And then um, she had several other degrees, I believe, as well. Mm -hmm. um, this is another from Anne, uh, which is kind of interesting. We haven't touched on. Can you say something about Mary Garrett's mother? What was she like? Were she and Mary close? Um, was she accomplished in any way? Um, and what was her influence on Mary's life? Well, they were very close. Mary was very close to both parents. And uh, Rachel was her mother's name. Or they, she was called Rit, R-I-T, was her nickname. And uh, she, there's so little written about her, which is not unusual for, for women at that time. But yeah, she was very close to Mary and... Um, it's interesting when, when Mary wanted money to buy something like a painting or a dress or something. And she was often afraid to go to her father. So she would go through her mother and ask her mother to intervene and get some money for her. She would buy $5,000 paintings and that sort of thing from the time she was a young woman. But no, there's not much written about um, the mother. And as far as I know, and looking through the archives, I did not see much written by her. Yeah. So that um, actually um, brings us to this next question from Judith. This is, um, can you please discuss your primary sources? Are they located in the JH archives? Um, so, and I think we've had mm -hmm. a couple questions about that actually. So, yeah. Well, um, oh, in lots of different places. I started uh, with the medical archives. And uh, of course, looking first at her involvement with medical school and there, there's a lot of uh, information and a lot of um, primary sources there. And then also the, uh, what used to be called the Eisenhower Library, I think it's called the Sheridan Library now, I'm not sure, but uh, there's of course great information about the founding of Hopkins uh, University. Uh, but the lion's share of her primary documents are up at Bryn Mawr College. Because when she, she died, she left everything to Carrie Thomas, who was president of Bryn Mawr. And she left all of her letters and there are a lot of documents relating to the B&O uh, Railroad up there. And uh, just great, great um, uh, records up there. Library of Congress, of course, with the Garrett family there are probably about, uh, I would say about seven, uh, maybe 60 boxes of files relating to the Garrett family businesses and the B&O and some letters from Mary in, in the Library of Congress, uh, Maryland Historical Society. You know, the Garretts were very prominent and 
Robert Garrett, Mary's grandfather, who first came to Baltimore uh, and ran a very successful business. So he left behind a lot of, of documents. And um, so, yeah, just they're all over the place. But I would say the primary, the bulk of her primary sources are up at Bryn Mawr College. Mm -hmm. So this is, um, might be our last question, but I think it's a great one um, from RSB. Can you talk about Boston marriage and the Friday uh, group's vow not to marry? So I think, I don't know if, did the Friday night group all vow not to marry? I know that I well, know Mary kind of explore, in her 20s, she kind of makes a deliberate decision that she's not going to marry. Mm -hmm. But sorry, yeah, if you could talk yeah. about that a little bit well, in the Boston marriages. Boston marriages are so interesting because I think this, this throws a whole different perspective on women's relationships at that time. In fact, uh, the term comes from uh, a, a novel by Henry James called The Bostonians. And he wrote about this new phenomenon that so many uh, women were living together. And this was very different, of course, from the uh, antebellum years. But after the war, of course, we had to take into consideration that there were... Um, a million men killed or wounded in the Civil War, and many of those would have been in, in the marriageable age uh, of Mary's generation. So after the war, there were a lot more opportunities for women as far as work, and many women chose to live together. Mary, for example, lived with Carrie Thomas, and uh, we don't know the exact na uh, nature of that relationship. It could have been just friend, uh, a friendship, it could have been sexual. Uh, no one, no one uh, spoke of lesbians back then. Um, it, it was not. No one cared that women were living together. And uh, you know, you look at uh, people like Willa Cather and Sarah Jewett, and even Henry James's sister Alice. They, you know, they were all in in uh, in uh, women relationships. And who knows? Uh, and also Frances Willard, the, the great president of the WCTU, Women's Christian Temperance Union. Temperance Union. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it was not unusual. And it could have been uh, just uh, that they wanted, they wanted companionship or who knows the nature of it. They didn't, they didn't write about it. As we write today, we write about everything today. But back then, they did not write about those personal issues at all. Okay, so I think we have time just for this last question. Um, and I, I like this. What was Mary's relationship with William Welch an important, this is from Mary Ann. Um, her relationship with William Welch, an important leader at the Hopkins Medical School, he was a real character. It would be interesting to hear about how she got along with him. He was a, he was a real character. He, he loved you know, I, yeah, trips to I Atlantic did. City and What did he do? Fruit. He went to Atlantic City? Oh yeah, he loved going to Atlantic City and riding like amusement, you know, roller coaster rides. <laughs> he would have large dinners where we had seven or eight desserts, you know, after a course of dinner. And yeah, you know, I, I hate to say I don't him. know that much about him. I know he became dean of the medical school. Uh, Mary kept in in uh, close touch with several of the uh, founding, the big four, as they were called, the founding doctors of the medical school. In fact, uh, a couple of them would sit with her in her. Um, box seat during the uh, suffrage convention. But um, I, I can't really answer that about Welsh. Um, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I know that he was one of, you know, he was one of her favorite doctors and uh, at, the, at the medical school. And he was one of the ones, of course, chosen for the portrait. Um, so I think that's um, probably all the time that we have tonight. I want to thank you very much, Kathy, for talking oh, to us. Thank about you. Your about your wonderful new, or um, you're not your new book, but the wonderful new edition of your, of your book. You. And um, I'd also like to thank everybody at the Hopkins for Hopkins at home team for helping out with this. And um, my director, Nancy McCall and Alicia Pulianese for their help with the exhibit. Um, this has been a really great talk and I hope everyone has enjoyed it. And there's, there's links and please join the rest of the um, conversations on Wednesdays in this series. So thank okay. you everybody well, and have a great okay. night. Thank you. Thank you all. Good night.